Our second speaker this afternoon is Whitney King. Whitney is the Frank and Theodora Meiselis Professor of Chemistry. He is in his 26th year teaching at Colby, trained as a chemical oceanographer. Whitney teaches general, environmental, and analytical chemistry courses. Professor King and his student researchers develop and build instruments for the analysis of metals and reactive oxygen species in natural waters. More than 100 research groups in more than, one, in, in more than 15 countries now use these instruments. I turn it over to Whitney King. Thank you, Laurie, and uh, welcome, President Green. I'm going to talk about uh, the chemistry that we're doing in the environment in sort of three parts. I'm going to talk about what it is to be an analytical chemist, and then talk about some of the work we're doing in the oceans, and then finally talk about some work we're doing in, in local main lakes. So what does an analytical chemist do? An analytical chemist makes the invisible visible. So this is a solution of dilute hydrogen peroxide. It's odorless, it's colorless. And you shouldn't drink it, but if you did, you wouldn't taste anything. <laughs> um, so our job is to analyze this, and we're going to do it by adding a reagent. And the reagent we add is an acridinium ester. And I'm about to pour it in, and boom, it flashes an intense blue color. And clearly, you can see that blue color um, to the naked eye. Now, we're working at concentrations that are much, much lower than that. Um, so we're going to hook up sensitive light detectors above these reactions measure the flux of light, convert that number uh, um, digitally, and trap it on a computer to build an instrument. Now, this is the one chemistry slide of my talk. <laughs> um, so for the three of you that care, um, <laughs> this is the molecule that we're interested in analyzing. And, and the way it works is this molecule is an acridinium ester. When you add this to base, the hydrogen peroxide and the ester bond, it then falls apart in four steps, and it produces light. So this reaction is called chemiluminescence. And it's the basis of a, a wide range of, of chemical analyses, including a lot of the genetic um, testing that we do. Um, we use chemiluminescence for a lot of the DNA testing um, in, in many of the uh, labs around the world. Now, this was a collaborative research project between my group at Colby, Bill Cooper at uh, UC Irvine, uh, Steve Russick and Barry Peake at the University of Otago in New Zealand, and they were the oceanographers uh, working in the Southern Ocean. James Kittle, who was an organic chemist who made that molecule for us. Dan O'Sullivan, who's an atmospheric chemist at the U.S. Naval Academy. And then Megan Malam and Chris Morgan, which were students of mine at Colby. So it took a pretty diverse group of people to build the molecule, characterize it, and then because we're oceanographers, take it to sea. So this is the research vessel, the Endeavor. Um, holds about 25 research scientists. And after we sort of worked out the chemistry of this reaction, um, we took it out to the Sargasso Sea. And this is Chris Morgan. I'm getting ready to go to sea. Um, and these are the bottles that we would use as an oceanographer to collect water samples from different depths, bring them to the surface, and analyze them. So this work was the basis of Chris's honors thesis. He then went on and got a PhD in analytical chemistry and now works for a uh, mass spec company building instrumentation for the pharmaceutical industry outside of Boston. Well, the chemiluminescent reaction I just showed you can be adapted to, range, to measure a whole range of other things in the ocean, and that includes iron and superoxide and hydrogen peroxide and chromium and cobalt uh, and copper. And we've published papers on, on how you do all of those measurements. And it turned out there wasn't a commercial instrument that people could purchase to do this analysis on board ships. And so in 2001, my, my wife, Jan King, and I started the company Waterville Analytical. And this is actually our instrument. The chemiluminescent reaction occurs in here. All the tubing just brings the reagents into the right place at the right time. And then we have uh, uh, make these actually in our basement. Um, <coughs> and we ship them to people all over the world. And so what they want to understand is this system. OK, so this is a false color image of the surface of the Earth. The red color is the, uh, the temperature, warm temperatures of the ocean. The blue are cold temperatures. And you can see that the ocean is an incredibly dynamic place. We want to understand that dynamic interaction between the atmosphere, these clouds, and the ocean, and in particular, how the oceans take up carbon dioxide, because it's carbon dioxide that is contributing to climate change. And we want to understand those dynamics. So we have researchers 
running these instruments in the Arctic and in the Antarctic in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I'll talk a little bit about some work we're doing in the Southern Ocean. And actually, there's a group at Oak Ridge National Labs that are using it for boiler water chemistry. It has nothing to do with, with oceanography. Um, now, the challenge is that to go to sea and to make these measurements is a, is a real logistical challenge. It takes lots of equipment and shipping and, and things that um, are challenging to do at Colby with a, a five-course load at regular semesters. And so fortunately, we have great collaborators right here in Maine. Um, at the Bigelow uh, Institute for Ocean Sciences, Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, and they go to, uh, to sea all the time. And they are great collaborators, both from an academic program, because they come to Colby and, and teach our students about oceanography, from a research program creating opportunities for our students to work there, uh, work at Bigelow in the summer. And for me, uh, they have a, a range of, of interesting uh, shipboard programs that we can join, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Great Belt Cruise in 2011. So in 2011, I was on sabbatical, and uh, Barney Balch and Ben Twining at Bigelow had funding from the National Science Foundation to understand this organism. This is E. huxleyi. It's a coccolithophore, and there are billions and billions of them in the Southern Ocean. Um, and these organisms are important on a global scale because they do this reaction. Carbon dioxide plus water plus nutrients produces biomass, oxygen, and calcium carbonate. That reaction is photosynthesis. And when you do photosynthesis, you pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and there's a sink for anthropogenic CO2. So that's the good news. The bad news is we keep adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and these organisms build their homes out of seashells. So this is calcium carbonate um, seashells. And just for a scale, this is about 100 microns, the size of a tip of a, of a, a pencil lead. And as we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we start to stress these organisms by dissolving their homes. And if we dissolve their homes, they can no longer fix carbon dioxide. And we now have a feedback mechanism that can amplify the effect of climate change. So the goal of this cruise was to understand how many of these organisms are out there, how do they grow, and what effect could carbon dioxide have on their survival over the next 10, 20, and 30 years. So to do that, we got on a ship in, in uh, Punta Arenas, Chile, in the Straits of Magellan. This is the um, Great Belt. It's the area of the uh, Atlantic, Southern Atlantic Ocean um, from the tip of South America to Africa. Um, and we were on the Scripps ship, the Melville, for 36 days, 120 stations, as we meandered back and forth across the belt uh, collecting samples. And, and my job in the cruise was measuring hydrogen peroxide. So if we zoom in a little, this old guy over here, that's me. Um, and the person next to me is actually a Colby student, Annie Warner, and she graduated a semester early so she could go on this cruise. So she actually learned about the cruise because Ben Twining was teaching her a jam plan course. And so this is Annie in the red, in the, the red uh, jacket. Um, so she graduated a semester early and joined the, this research expedition. And when she was at sea, she was a full-fledged member of the scientific team. She was helping to collect water samples. She was processing samples 12 hours a day. And we had some fun, right? We stayed far away from the icebergs, and we got close to the whales. So that was, that was great. Um, now, oceanography seems sort of glamorous, but after 36 days, you're really glad to get off the ship. <laughs> so we're smiling because this is Cape Town in the background, and we're about to get off. Um, and then after 2011, we sort of went our separate ways. And in preparing for some talks in the last year, I, I contacted Annie and said, you know, what impact did this experience have on your career? And here's what she said. After the research cruise, I was certain I wanted to focus my career on the ocean. Now, she was a scientist when she went on the cruise. And I became interested in doing so from a policy perspective, right? Now, there's an interesting lesson there. And in 2013, I decided to attend Vermont Law School. And so she's now a second year law student. And she just spent the summer at the Monterey Institute doing a very prestigious internship on ocean policy. So there's an example of a liberal arts experience informing someone on exactly what they like and what they don't. I get seasick. I get this sort of oceanography thing, right? OK. Well, the good news is that the experience that Annie's had is, is not unique. Um, Barney Balch, in red, was the chief scientist on the Great Belt Cruise. He got off the ship in Africa, flew back to Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, spent two weeks, two months at home, and then got on the, the Healy. This is a US Coast Guard icebreaker. And uh, 
This is a, a, another Colby student that was out with him in the, in the North Atlantic, in the Arctic, uh, investigating phytoplankton crews. This is um, Matt Stevens, okay? And then a year later, I got two more Colby students. This is Jade Enright and Leanne Powers. Jade is a, uh, currently a senior at Colby, and Leanne is class of, of 2008. And I got a call from Leanne's boss saying, hey, we need a student that can help us measure hydrogen peroxide in the North Pacific. So this is their crews last summer in the North Pacific uh, measuring hydrogen peroxide and looking at the influence of light on, on deep ocean water as it, as it comes to the surface. Um, and Jade actually uh, got a chance to go to sea again, thanks to Ben Twining. Ben Twining is another senior scientist at Bigelow. He called me in February and said, I've got space on this really cool research project off the California coast. And there's Jade, you're in here somewhere, um, um, participating on, a, on an international collaboration to understand the influence of upwelling currents bringing iron to the surface off the California coast and the role that plays on, on climate. So that's a little bit of story about some of the work we're doing in, in oceanography. I'm going to change gears now and talk a little bit about some work we're doing closer to home. Um, and many of you may have seen the news articles this summer about the uh, algae blooms in, in Lake Erie. Algae blooms making Toledo water undrinkable. This is a picture of an anabena bloom on the, on the uh, shore of Lake Erie right next to the water intake pipe for the city of Toledo. And you would look at this, they, they actually had to shut the water system down. I mean, this is, this is toxic soup, and it's, it's something that you can't use as a municipal water supply. And those of us that live in New England think, well, okay, that's a problem in the Midwest, and that's a problem in the South. But this is a Google Earth image taken two years ago over Great East Pond and North Pond in uh, the Belgrade Lakes. This is seven miles from campus. And you can kind of see from where you're sitting that North Pond looks nice and dark, and that's because you can see all the way through the water column to the sediment. It's clear. And East Pond's pretty green, and that's because there's an anabena bloom in East Pond pretty close to what that was happening in Lake Erie. And so this is kind of a yuck factor, and it has impacts on uh, uh, tourism and property values, and, and so we want to understand this process. And the chemistry of this, or the biology of this really, is, is not any different than what we were studying in the ocean. Carbon dioxide plus water plus nutrients produces biomass, it's photosynthesis. The problem is we've got too much biomass being produced, and that biomass produces a green slime, and that's what you can actually see in this aerial photograph. And if you go out to East Pond today, it looks pretty much the same. The lake today is, is still in, in full bloom. So we were fortunate to be funded um, through the National Science Foundation and Maine EPSCOR to try to investigate uh, this problem in the Belgrades. And this is another example of a really exciting collaborative project. Um, this is work um, between myself in chemistry, Kathy Bevere in biology, Russ Cole, Philip Nyhus, and Denise Brusewitz in environmental studies, Jim Fleming in science and technology studies, Michael uh, Donahue, Sahan Bisayaki, in economics, and then uh, Maggie Shannon, Charlie Bader, uh, Peter Callan, and Kathy Wall. These are conservation professionals working in the Belgrade. So this was a interdisciplinary team, and we really wanted to answer three questions. Sort of first, we wanted to understand um, how the Belgrades work as a unique laboratory to understand coupled ecological systems. We wanted to put this into the context of a $5 billion economy based on main lakes. And Finally, our goal is to find main base solutions to these declining uh, water quality problems. So what can a homeowner do? If you want to spend $10,000 to help your lake, what should you first spend your first $5,000 on? What should you spend your next $3,000 on, et cetera? What is going to have the maximum impact on your community and on your ecosystem? So to do this, we put together a team of 11 faculty well over 60 students supported by the National Science Foundation and uh, Colby, 10 different stakeholder groups, and we're investigating this, this one really interesting watershed. So we have students out on boats, uh, working in the GIS lab, these are some of Phillips students, getting in the water, collecting sediment samples, and interacting with the community to understand their priorities in this lake system. We've been really fortunate to be funded by the college to add some, some really cool new technology to this problem. 
This is Goldie, the Great Pond Sentinel. This is a, a, a buoy that sits out in the middle of the lake and uh, is continuously broadcasting the condition of the lake. So this is like a lake weather station. And our goal is to try to uh, capture the status of the lake and to inform the community about it so that they are engaged and proactive in, in conservation measures. And finally, uh, our, our work in the Belgrades has been facilitated by the Maine Lakes Resource Center, which was a conservation center funded through 700 different um, uh, private donations. And it's a center for public outreach and communication, community engagement, but it also has research labs and boat docks and facilities for doing research. And um, we've had over 800 students, mostly uh, facilitated by uh, Kathy Bevere and her students, 800 eighth graders come out to the, to the uh, Main Lakes Resource Center. Um, and all the funding for all that was, was provided by the Goldfarb Center. So the Main Lakes Resource Center gave us a place to do this work. So if you want to know more about our work in the Belgrade, Google Saving Our Lakes, Maine Public Broadcasting did a nice half hour documentary on our work. And uh, if you're interested later on, I can give you the web address for our buoys um, that are providing real-time data on the water quality um, on Great Pond. Finally, I want to say that these collaborations are, are exciting, and they're contagious, and I'm really uh, um, pleased to acknowledge three new colleagues that have become part of this work. Um, it's really exciting to see how uh, the, the team of, of faculty and their students have expanded our capabilities and really engaged the community on a, an important issue uh, related to uh, the Belgrades and the, and the greater Waterville community. So with that, I will stop and be happy to answer questions. <laughs> I'm supposed to do that. Yeah. So thank you, Whitney. I I just want to add that as an economist, I am so pleased that our collaboration with uh, Bigelow Labs always allows me now to read and pronounce properly coccolithophore, which has been an enormous <laughs> part of our part. Um, the floor is open for questions. Again, please wait for a mic, raise your hand, and then please, if you will, wait for a microphone. Thank you, Whitney. Can Paul, you there you go. Paul, microphone. Oh, thank you, Whitney. Um, can you tell us? Uh, just a capsule as to why East Pond was like that and North Pond wasn't. And as a subset, what, how should we spend our first $10,000? <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> uh, where am I going here? So chemists come with extra slides. <laughs> I'm going the wrong way. Um, well, I'm going to fail on the extra slide, so let me tell you what's going on. Um, basically, what's happening on East Pond is it stratifies very early in the season. And when it stratifies, the surface layer of East Pond and the bottom layer of East Pond are separated physically by the thermocline. And when that happens, the bottom layer goes anoxic. So there's no oxygen in the bottom of the lake. And under anoxic conditions, we release all the nutrients that have built up in that layer over 50 years into the water column. Um, and the nutrients that we're worried about in this case is phosphorus. So uh, stratification early on releases nutrients into the bottom water. The um, bottom water um, in Great Pond stays at the bottom of the lake until about November. But in East Pond, it stays in the bottom of the lake until August 10th this year. Okay? And because it comes to the surface early, and that's because East Pond is shallow, um, it promotes a bloom. And so it's really about um, how we partition nutrients within the lake ecosystem. And uh, when that occurs, that determines the, the timing of the bloom. So that was, the, I think, the first part to your, your question. Uh, the second part is, what do we do about it? Um, the first thing we do is we need to decrease the amount of nutrients that all the people living around the lake are contributing to the lake by about 10%. It's not a big number, but if you add 10%, if you compound 10% over 50 years, that's way too much uh, phosphorus. So we need to decrease it by 10%, and that will slow down the, the decline in, in water quality. And then on East Pond, we probably need to spend about five to six million dollars and add aluminum to the bottom of the lake. And that'll sequester all the phosphorus, and that will improve the situation in the long term. So East Pond's a little bit different um, uh, than Great Pond. In Great Pond, you don't need to add the aluminum. In East Pond, we probably do. Any other questions? <clears throat> 
obviously with a vested interest in Great Pond, uh, Whitney, I, uh, I, I surprised you didn't say it was the difference between Dick Schmaltz and me, which was a, why we had the difference. But um, what I'd like to know is how, how widely has the community around all the Belgrade Lakes, both the summer people and the year-round people, accepted the kind of work that you're doing? And, and how do we measure that, actually? Um, well, in East Pond, it's easy because it's in full bloom right now. So you don't have to tell anyone that, that the lake's going to bloom because they can look outside their, their camp and see it. On, uh, on Great Pond, it's, it's actually trickier. And we're currently uh, developing a, a basin-wide, um, Belgrade Lake-wide watershed plan. Um, and one of the things we did this summer is to get everyone together and say, just how urgent do you think this is? And the consensus among the, the sort of the scientists and the policymakers is that this is sort of a problem that we're going to face on Great Pond. Um, and, and the analogy for Great Pond is China Lake, not East Pond. So there's a China Lake scenario for Great Pond in the next two decades. Um, and I don't think that's wildly, widely held right now. And that's one of our, our uh, uh, community outreach components over the next year is to sort of articulate that risk and then to get people to adopt practices that reduce that risk not in 20 years, but now, because it's going to be a 20-year solution. And by the time it blooms, it's going to be a multi-million dollar fix. And we want to avoid that. So, so that's kind of an answer to your question. Dick? I don't get up here much anymore. Um, fortunately, about a liberal arts education, uh, that uh, our students have to take broad curriculum, and science is still part of that experience for those that aren't scientifically oriented. How do you make science interesting for the non-scientific people as part of their liberal arts experience? And how do you recruit more for, to take part in that beginning chemistry kind of experience? <laughs> You're killing me here. How do you make chemistry exciting, right? Well, um, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for those that aren't us. I mean, I think in any discipline, you need to bring it back to why it's relevant, why it makes you an effective leader, why it's going to be important to your career and your interests moving forward. Um, we heard about the student that was interested in, in removing BPA from uh, packaging and compounds. Um, when you're making those, if you're going to be an advocate for the removal of a, an organic compound in water, you better understand what that compound is, what's the toxicity, and what's the fate. And if you can do that, uh, then you're a much more powerful advocate um, for the removal of that compound. And so I think it's sort of beholding to all of us to try to draw the connections between all of our disciplines. Why is it important that as a policymaker you understand the chemical structure of the molecule you might be asked to regulate? And if we can do that, um, then it's, it's and, and advising comes into play, right? Because I, a senior in high school isn't going to draw those connections. It's really up to the faculty to, to draw those connections and point out where that student might want to consider additional courses. Um, so we have a course in, in uh, green chemistry and sustainability coming on in the uh, next year. And there's a good example of how we can, we can uh, make those connections to uh, climate change and sustainability, which is a topic that's uh, really important to a lot of students on campus. I know I'm asking you to climb inside Annie Warner's head. Yeah. But she went from scientist to being interested in being on the policy side. Has it, could you capture for us some of those conversations you might have had with her about that journey from science to where she's ended up so far? Mm. <laughs> Maybe not. No, I, I mean, um, I think Annie really enjoyed the science, but I think she felt she personally could make a greater impact um, doing policy. I mean, she had that passion. And I think we're all much more effective when we're passionate about what we're doing. And so I think in, in her case, she, she spent a year as an intern for an environmental law firm. And she saw the impact that that internship had. And, and she got the job because she just spent three months 
on the ocean doing environmental measurement. She had a sense. She had, she had this ties back to Dick's question. She had a tie-in to what it was like to collect data and process it and work with it. So she had that experience. That got her the job after Colby, which was an internship in an environmentally oriented firm. But I think she could see how that uh, path for her um, was going to be more fulfilling and, and potentially more productive. So. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Just quick question and then quick answer. Bill, can we get our mic? Thanks. Thanks, Whitney. As a former member of the political science department here, uh, do you do you have any work in the state or in the local communities around the lake about new regulations rather than all voluntary? Quick answer. The answer is yes. <laughs> um, the, there's um, uh, uh, both formally, um, we have done a very good job in the last legislative session to uh, beat back efforts by the current administration to uh, ease uh, or, or eliminate shoreland zoning regulations. So that's the uh, really important. Maine has one of the best shoreland zoning uh, set of regulations of any state in New England, and that has helped preserve our lakes and keep them as pristine as they are. And we need to work very hard to make sure that those regulations stay in force. And then the second thing that happened in the legislature was they funded the Lake Smart program, which was a volunteer program to encourage people to uh, build their properties and maintain their properties along the lake to have minimal environmental impact. And so that program was funded. It was funded to produce, it was funded so that volunteer organizations could work with their communities to promote Lake Smart practices. Whitney, thank you very much. You're welcome.